My head hurts. I don't even know why I'm here. Why I'm writing this. I should be somewhere else. I should be doing something. But I keep thinking. I keep thinking I should post here. Maybe that would be a good idea. I've always wanted to be a barista. Sure, it's never been an avid dream of mine. Like the fantasies we have as kids. Well, I don't know. Maybe someone out there dreams to serve coffee for the rest of their life. For me, it wasn't really a fantasy, like being a ballerina or an astronaut. Instead, like many other college students killing themselves to make a decent wage, I needed cash. I needed cash, and I needed it bad. I've always marveled baristas, though. I've ordered a coffee at 8 a.m. before class and watched a sleep-deprived teenager turn into some kind of artist with whipped cream, transforming my macchiato into their canvas, a piece of art worthy of an award. Seriously, what they do has to be magic. At least, that's what I thought. I always wondered how they do it, how they made these drinks without having a mental breakdown. It's the kind of thing I've always known I'd suck at. But I wanted to try. So I did some research. And by that I mean I went on YouTube and watched a barista vlogs. Yeah, they exist. I was surprised too. There are hundreds of channels, all dedicated to half-hour videos where you get to watch them make these weird and wacky drinks. It's kind of therapeutic to watch. When I wasn't in class or sleeping, I was watching these videos to get a basic idea. I knew I couldn't just go in without experience. They would all laugh at me. I spent maybe a few weeks researching and writing down all the different kinds of coffee, milkshakes and smoothie. There were so many combinations, and the pace it was done at made my brain hurt. You might be sitting there thinking making coffee is easy, and it is, when you can memorize an order and know the combinations by heart. After weeks of trying and failing and giving up and trying again, I handed in my resume to my local Starbrooks, as well as pretty much every store in walking vicinity. Starbrooks had been my go-to coffee shop all the way through my freshman and junior years of college. I'd watched baristas come and go. I could even name them. Becca, who couldn't use the coffee machine. Jake, who helped her out. Luca, who always gave me extra whipped cream. I wanted to be a part of them. They looked like a family behind the counter, laughing and chatting while making coffees and serving customers. I know it's not always like that. We're all human. Life can be a bitch and get in the way. Sometimes they looked tired and their smiles were lesser than shadows under their eyes. Like they hadn't slept. Like they'd been up all night. Luca wasn't always smiling, Becca wasn't always laughing. They were college kids, and I expected them to have at least some humanity, even if customer service demanded they shed it. But it was the kind of job I wanted. I wasn't expecting a reply. It's not out of the ordinary when I don't get replies. Most jobs ignore me. I've applied for the local music store multiple times, and according to my online application, it's still pending. It's been pending for two years, so I wasn't hopeful. It was more likely that independent coffee shops would take me on. Still, I waited for several weeks, with the application at the back of my mind. I still watched the barista vlogs because it was something relaxing to sit back to after class, when I was stressing over finals. I got a call maybe a week ago in the middle of class. Normally it's my mom, so I have to mute it. I didn't recognize the number, but I found myself excusing myself from the lecture. The woman on the other end of the line had a voice like nails on a chalkboard. She seemed way too happy about calling me, like she'd been waiting all day. It was jarring. Hello there. Am I correct in saying I'm speaking to Miss Satori? <laughs> yes, I said, groggily suddenly forgetting how to speak English, as well as basic etiquette on a business call. I'd found myself falling asleep in the middle of my lecture. I tend to do that a lot. Sure, my lectures are interesting, but the room is cozy. 
the ambience of students typing and my professor's smooth voice like honey trickling in my ears. I shook my head of mind fog and pasted on a smile that I knew she couldn't see. Uh, y yes, uh, speaking. Hello, Miss Satori. I apologize for the delay in getting back to you. My name is Anna. I'm the assistant manager at Starbrooks. We love your application. We think you'd be a great addition to our team. Would you be able to attend an interview at around five? She laughed lightly. Again, I apologize for getting back to you so late. We've had a lot of applications to get through, and you're certainly caught my eye. You're a student, right? I have to say, Miss Satori, with your current qualifications I have in front of me, we think you would be perfect. Qualifications. I had to mentally go over my resume. I left school with a 3.9 GPA, and I had worked in my local Sephora in my hometown before college. I opened my mouth to correct her, but hey, I was going to turn away an opportunity to work as a barista. Yes, I said again. Anna's words were going in one ear and out the other. All I was able to say was yes and nod. My cheeks felt like they were going to burn off. She was speaking so fast I could barely understand what she was saying. I had to talk over her. Uh, yes, I I'm currently in my senior year. I have class four times a week. I wasn't sure what I was saying and why I was saying it. The words were streaming out of me before I could stop myself. I know my roommate lied about her grades to get a job in social media marketing. They wanted straight A's and she didn't even pass math. Still though, they never checked. Mom always told me employers never do. Anna, however, didn't seem to care. It sounded like she was reaching for anything that I was apparently good at. Instead of just admitting I was the ideal candidate because I was a broke college student with barely any social life and free nights. They were really exploiting kids, huh? Well, we can work around that, Anna seemed to say everything with expletive. Is five okay? Today? Yes, today would be preferable. We're quiet around five, so that is when we conduct our interviews. Oh, right. I felt stupid. Yeah, five is fine. I paused, my heart jackhammering in my chest. Do I need any experience? Anna laughed. Well, what do you think training is for? Miss Satori experiences, of course, preferred like in every job. However, we put our employees through an induction course where they learn all they need to know. I can assure you, no first-hand experience is required. She let out a sigh. I have to say this a lot. You have no idea. Oh. I perked up a little. I'll be there after classes end. Do I need to bring anything? Anna chuckled. Your brain is all we need, she said. And some common sense, of course, but no, we don't require extensive paperwork. However, we would appreciate a physical copy of your resume and your ID. I can bring them. That's no problem, I said. I felt like jumping up and down. A job. An actual paid job as a barista where I'd be fully trained? The store was maybe a 10-minute walk away from my apartment. It was perfect. Great, I'll see you there, Anna said, and I couldn't keep the grin off my face. She ended the call before I could respond, but I didn't care. All the way through class, I couldn't stop thinking about the interview. A million questions were buzzing around in my brain. Would the interview be with Anna or with someone else? What if I got choked up and messed up? Anna had explicitly said I didn't need any experience. But then I was overthinking everything she had said. It was polite not to ask for it, right? So what if they did need it and Anna expected me to know that? What if she wanted me to make a double espresso latte with ten types of sauce and whipped cream right in front of her? By the end of class, I was sweating and my gut was twisting with nausea. I kept picking up my phone and then dropping it in my lap over and over again. I wanted to ring Anna and tell her I'd made a mistake, but that was just anxiety taking hold. To soothe my mind, I grabbed a coffee from the campus store and took slow sips. A triple venti, half-sweet, non-fat, caramel macchiato, was my go-to when I was stressed. But that day, it was too sweet, too sickly. I couldn't enjoy it without worrying about how it was made. On the way out of my last class of the day, I checked my phone. 4.45. I had 15 minutes to go to the bathroom and make myself at least look presentable and then head to the interview. 
by make myself look presentable, I mean comb through my hair with my fingers and put in a high pony and wash my face. I wasn't an avid believer in astrology, but I was convinced the stars were practically screaming that I was going to tank my interview. When I walked through the door, I was assaulted with the familiar aroma of crushed coffee beans and brownies. It was the kind of smell I was used to, and I immediately relaxed. Anna greeted me at the counter. She was right. The store was pretty dead. I could only glimpse dead-eyed college kids and businessmen typing on MacBooks. There were four interviewees. The other three looked to be my age and seemed nice enough. Two guys and a girl. The girl had pretty hair, I remember thinking. It fell in blonde waves in front of her face. She was way too pretty to be a barista. The guys were like no other guys I'd met before. I only knew the frat kind that ended up in my roommate's bed every morning. These guys, though, were different. Like they just stepped out of a Dungeons and Dragons convention. One of them had red hair sprouting from a baseball cap and had a strong British accent. The other didn't say a word and hid under a bright yellow hoodie which hung off a slimmer frame. Welcome! Anna was maybe my mom's age, with dark hair pulled into a ponytail and a permanent smile that seemed to be glued to her face. She was exactly the kind of person I'd pictured on the phone call. You're all here for the barista position, Anna pointed at us individually, counting us. Ah, all of you made it. That's a relief. None of us spoke. I guess we had made a silent mutual agreement to only communicate through nods and hums, though Anna didn't seem to mind. Great. Why don't you follow me to the back and we can get started? Um, excuse me. The blonde raised her hand like she was in class. Are the interviews separate? Yeah, the British guy nodded, playing with a loose curl of his hair. Is this a group thing or... Anna shook her head. Oh, I thought it was obvious from what I told each of you on the phone. You all have the job. There is no interview process. I just need you guys to take a little test, and then we'll be watching a training video as part of your induction. She folded her arms. Is that okay with you four? It won't take long. The guy with the hoodie lifted his head, confusion crinkling his expression. Wait, so we're all hired? He said something else, the latter of his words enveloped by the screeching sound of beans being grounded in the blender. I tried not to cover my ears, but that was loud. I felt it like knives sticking directly into my skull. Anna was still talking, though I had to step closer to her to fully understand what she was saying. Yes, now if you'll follow me, we're going to go someplace quieter. She eyed the blender and the guy behind it. He looked several years older than the four of us, maybe his late twenties. He seemed unfazed by the noise, dancing with his torso to some pop song on the radio. Rich? Anna's voice broke through the machine's seemingly endless wail. Can you turn that off? The man, or Rich, seemed to snap out of it and nodded, switching off the blender. I caught his eye for a moment and he held it. I'm not sure why. It was awkward, so I looked away, but I still felt his eyes on me. He didn't speak only shutting off the blender and turning to serve a customer. Thank you. Anna rolled her eyes. Please excuse Rich. He's a lovely guy, not the smartest, however. She gestured behind the counter and we followed her through a pair of swinging doors. We were led onto a narrow corridor with stained and cracked lino and bruised yellow walls. Not exactly the most hygienic place. Anna took us in the first room. It looked to be her office. There were already four chairs positioned behind a messy desk full of paper and old Starbucks cups. I noticed a binder hanging off the edge. There was something printed on the front that looked familiar. I'd seen it before. It was a logo of some sort, but I couldn't remember where I'd seen it. Before I could look further, Anna placed a stray cup over it. She took a seat behind an expensive-looking laptop which was idle. If you would like to sit down, I'll be with you in a moment. Anna started typing on her computer, grabbing paperwork and sorting them into a pile next to her. I grabbed a seat and watched her. I figured the mess of paperwork were our resumes. The four of us sat in a comfortable silence for a moment while Anna typed vigorously on her laptop. 
When my palms were starting to go sweaty in my lap, she finally lifted her head. All right, so there's something I'd like you guys to fill out first. It's just a small test so I can get to know you a little more. She stood up and grabbed a handful of paper before depositing a sheet to each of us. Then she gave us a pen. The blonde looked up. So we just fill these in? Yep. Oh, uh, just wait a second. Anna disappeared out of the door for a moment, and the four of us exchanged looks. The others looked like they were going to laugh. It seemed absurd that we were being tested like we were back in school. I was so used to using a laptop and typing, I struggled to remember if I was right or left-handed. Anna came back in a rush, her cheeks pink. She was holding four cups of coffee, depositing them in front of us. When I picked mine up, it was a simple black coffee. Anna told us we had ten minutes to complete the test before wandering out of the room. Outside, I noticed it had started to get dark. The sky was awash with pretty oranges and yellows. I took a sip from the cup and burnt my tongue. It tasted good. It was the type of coffee I worshipped when I stayed up all night to write an essay. There was a tang to it, and I wondered what it was. Maybe syrup or added espresso? Pushing mostly stray thoughts to the back of my mind, I focused on the first question. The scratching sounds of pen on paper filled the room, and I hurried to follow behind the other three. The font was weird, I noticed. I don't think I recognized it. It reminded me of a doctor's scrawl. Question 1. What is your name? Simple enough, I thought. I wrote Mackie Satori. My handwriting wasn't the best, but I figured that didn't matter. Question 2. What is your age? Reading the text was hurting my eyes. Squinting, I scribbled, 22. Question 3 confused me. It was a math question, not an easy one either. I wasn't great at math, so I was automatically struggling. With the pressure of trying to figure out some complicated problem combined with the text, my head was starting to hurt. After a while of trying to count on my fingers, failing to count in my head, and risking a glance at the blonde's paper, I wrote my best guess, which I knew was wrong. I knew it was wrong because it was a random number. Come on, I thought. It's not like the math problem mattered. Exhaling out of breath, I moved on to the next question. Question 4. Read this paragraph very carefully. Do you suffer from sleep deprivation? 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 Yes? No? My eyes felt heavy, a dull fog settling over my mind. It kept going halfway down the page. I couldn't stop reading it, like the words were leading my eyes further down. No, I didn't, I thought. But the more I read, the more I started to wonder if I did. I did stay up most nights because of my assignments. I circled yes. Question 5. Are you alone right now? Yes. No. My pen started to shake in my hands. I knew I wasn't, but it was clear the test was trying to mess with my head and wanted out of the box answers. After hesitating, I circled yes. Question 6. Are you sure? Yes. No. When I glanced up, my stomach twisted. I could see the girl's head bobbing up and down, one of the guys chewing his pen but I still felt like what I was seeing was wrong. Slowly, I scribbled out my first answer and circled no. Question 7. There are five of you in this room right now. Who, out of the following, does not exist? I dropped my pen, but something came over me, a sensation taking over my hands. I grabbed it quickly, my gaze skimming over the multiple-choice answers. I wanted to leave, to throw my paper down and get the hell out of there. But something came over me. My hold on the pen tightening. I couldn't let go of it. Ben, Sam, Luna, Jack, me, I don't exist. When I risked a look up, I was seeing three faces. I knew there were three faces. I'd learned their names before we'd all walked in. I'd shared a cigarette with Sam in the rain. I had laughed at Luna's anecdote about her overprotective mother and smiled at Ben when he'd offered a shy wave. 
so why couldn't I remember? I remembered walking in the door. I remember Anna's bright smile. Rich, behind the coffee machine, shooting me a scowl. So why couldn't I remember them? The test wanted an answer, so I hesitantly circled Jack. Question 8. Are you enjoying this test? Yes. 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 Swallowing something rancid, crawling up my throat, I circled yes. The others weren't reacting to the test, and I couldn't help wondering why. It was some kind of trick, surely, but none of them were speaking. When I glanced up, they were embroiled in their own papers. My head was starting to pound, the taste of coffee still lingering on my tongue, making me nauseous. Outside, it was pitch black. When I looked around for a clock, there was none, though I could have sworn there had been one above Anna's desk. I'd seen it because I remember being surprised that it was almost quarter to seven. I'd arrived at five. My head started to spin. Had we really spent an hour greeting Anna? How had I lost a whole hour and not even realized it? And why was I only noticing this now? Blinking rapidly, I moved on to the next question. Question 9. How long did it take you to realize Jack does not exist? You have always known? You only just realized. I circled B. The next question stood out among all the rest. It was in block capitals. Question 10. Find the red square. There were no answers. No multiple choice options. After a disorienting second of staring at my paper like an idiot, I scanned the page and then turned it over, searching for any red squares. There weren't any. I was flipping my paper over, squinting trying to see if they were hidden in the text, or they could only be seen when you really concentrated, when Anna breezed back through the door. All right, pens down, she ordered. I didn't even get to recheck my answers before she was tearing the paper from my hands. Again, I expected the others to say something, like the kind of thing that was burning in the back of my mouth. What the hell, I wanted to say. I wanted to stand up and walk out of there. But the way Anna positioned herself in front of us made me realize she wasn't finished. I felt for my phone to get a proper look at the time, but it wasn't in my pocket. I started to inwardly panic, but then I remembered. Oh yeah, that fog was back, encasing my mind in cotton candy. I left it in my bag, which was in the storage room. How could I forget? I was so, so clumsy sometimes. How did you find the test? Anna asked, her eyes piercing each of us. The blonde, Luna, stood up with a shaky smile. Do you mind if I get going? Her voice was panicked. I don't think this is the job for me. Anna nodded, still with that bright smile. Of course, Luna, after the training video. But I don't want the job, she whispered. Can I please go? Yes, after the training video. Now follow me. Anna said, her tone growing stern. I waited for Luna to give up and walk out, but she didn't. She nodded slowly, her cheeks paling. It was almost like the four of us were trapped under a spell. We couldn't move. We couldn't question authority. When alarm bells started ringing in our heads, they were quickly silenced. I stood up too. My body tipped to the left and then the right. The clock was back. 11.35. The time struck me as... Wrong. No, it couldn't be eleven. We had only been in the office for twenty minutes. I opened my mouth to say this, but Anna was already ushering us to the door and back down the hallway. But we weren't going back to the storefront. We were going deeper. The corridor felt like it was going on forever, and time, time seemed to slow down. I could see an ending to the corridor, but the closer I got to it, it got further away like it was playing with me. When I was staring hard at Anna's back, I could still see the words, Do you suffer from sleep deprivation? Still flickering at the backs of my eyes. When I shook my head, I glimpsed something small, something white, bouncing along with the others. A tiny white rabbit. I shook my head again, but no, I wasn't seeing things. The tiny rabbit turned to look directly at me with beady eyes and lifted a small white paw. It was gesturing for me to keep going, bouncing between the boy's legs. So I did. I kept going, until the corridor ended on a simple wooden door. When Anna told us to go inside, 
I stopped at the threshold. Just looking at the room sent slithers of panic down my spine, but something pushed me forward, despite my body refusing to follow. The room reminded me of an old classroom. The walls were starched white and there were four desks. That was it. Four walls and four desks. The others were hesitant walking in, and I followed, keeping an eye on the door. The rabbit had disappeared. Anna stood at the front, still smiling, like she knew something we didn't. Sit down, please. She nodded at the desks. Any desk will do. Is this another test? Luna acted like the desk was teeming with spiders when she took an uncertain seat. Anna shook her head. No, this is the last stage of your induction. When I slumped down at the desk, the boys falling suit, the door opened, and I recognized the guy who had been grinding coffee beans. Rich. He wheeled an ancient-looking TV set inside the room, positioning it in front of us. I felt like I was back at school, back in middle school when the teacher would let us watch Bill Nye the Science Guy. I'd always found the introduction kind of hypnotizing. The room suddenly went dark, and the TV flickered onto a dark blue screen. Rich left, and Anna leaned against the door with her arms folded across her chest. Again, I wanted to speak. I think we all did. But the words wouldn't form coherently in my mind. The television flickered again like an old VCR, before text appeared in bright white. Silver screen home video system, Froj Blue. Introductory training. Test 1 intro. Test 2 mirror. Test 3 lullaby. I waited for something to happen. For a moment there was nothing, before the top option blinked like it was being selected. After a second, the screen erupted into static before a video started. It had reminded me of those old VCRs my parents still had at home. I could tell it was damaged, or it had been used too many times because it kept skipping, colors mixing into one confusing hue. I'd seen some training videos for McDonald's on YouTube, and it was similar to that. Music started. It was an upbeat and playful. A woman popped out of nowhere with a wide smile. She looked to be in the background of a Starbucks. There were people in the background making coffee and loud laughter and chat. The presenter looked directly into the camera. You've just landed your dream job with us, she said loudly, never losing that smile. So what next? Well, we have to train you up, of course. The screen flashed to three teenagers in 70s wear. The woman's voice continued while the camera panned on each one. We're going to show you the do's. It cut to the woman nodding with a smile. And the don'ts. Her grin twisted into a frown. Of working at your favorite coffee chain. Now, without further ado, let's get started. Sarah is going to show you guys everything you need to know. The screen cut to a kid washing their hands vigorously, and Comic Sans text popped up above her head. Let's talk about hygiene, the presenter said. Now, you're going to wash your hands three times, okay? And then put on your apron, just like Sarah. The camera panned to the girl doing exactly what the presenter was saying. I watched Sarah being led through several steps, which included checking stock, making sure surfaces were clean, before she finally put a plastic cup on the counter. The woman appeared again, this time slightly off screen, and the screen collapsed into static. The video was still going on and I could hear the presenter's voice, but there was something overlaying the garbled static. At first I thought I was seeing things, before the screen turned a bright white. It was so bright, I wanted to look away. I wanted to cry out, but I couldn't. There was text in front of me, those same words on my test and block capitals practically screaming at me. Find the red squares. But there weren't any. I couldn't find any. The video jumped back into frame. Sarah was making a mocha and the presenter was standing behind her. While I was watching the demonstration, that same message played again over and over in my mind. Find the red squares. Find the red squares. I was looking for them, forcing my way through the footage. Through the static, I was half aware of Anna in front of me. I felt her breath on my cheeks. I felt her cold hands forcing my wrists to the armrest and pinning them down with something. Velcro? 
I couldn't cry out. My eyes were glued to the screen. When I tried to shut them, Anna's ice-cold fingers were prying them open. Something replaced her fingers. Tape. Tiny pieces of tape held my eyelids open. I managed to move my lips, but all I could manage was a soft moan. I had no choice. I had to watch. I had to find the squares. 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 The screen flickered from red to orange. Then the Starbrooks presenter was back making something. A mocha, I thought. Yes, a mocha. Her eyes flicked to the camera. Okay, so what we're going to do to make the perfect mocha is... She started to explain and I found myself mouthing her words. They came so easy to me, pouring from my lips, but with no sound. I noticed something at the corner of my eye. Something was pulsing at the top of the screen. A red square. When my eyes found it, the square moved to the middle, then was at the bottom left-hand corner. I followed it eagerly. The faster it was, my eye movements tracked it perfectly. When the presenter had finished the drink and was holding it up in the air, I was tracking twelve different squares flashing from corner to corner, left to right. Okay then, test one. The presenter's voice dulled in my mind. It sounded less enthusiastic and over the top. No, it was a voice telling me what to do. It was giving me... It was giving me an order. Come on, guys, I, I just showed you. The woman was laughing, her grin growing bigger and bigger. Step one, I found myself saying, the others echoing. Wash your hands. Very good. The woman on the screen smiled like she could hear us. And what, step two? The red squares were back, but they were bigger, growing bigger and bigger. Step two, we said. We grind the beans in the blender. That's right, the woman said. And what if your establishment does not have a blender? We use a rolling pin, we said back. The woman nodded. You're doing so well, guys. Why don't you give yourself a pat on the back? I strained to move my hands to do it, but I couldn't move. The woman's smile grew. There you go. Now, step three. Come on, say it with me. And remember, service with a smile. I don't want to see any frowns. The red squares were glowing brighter. I felt my lips widening into a grin that hurt my jaw. The presenter's image wavered, and she looked almost 3D, like she was coming out of the TV. Step three. Our voices fell in sync with hers, and I couldn't control myself. I couldn't control my body. I couldn't control my smile that had quickly become a demented grin. We start whipping the cream and clearing the surfaces of any unused ingredients. The red squares were flashing in every corner now. I caught each one, and every question the woman asked me, I answered. When the screen flashed to another bright red screen with the words, Please stand by, I felt my left eye strain. Whatever was holding it open was struggling, and then something snapped. The tape, or whatever it was, came loose. My left eye was free, and once it was... That something was screaming, piercing my ear. I felt it rooted inside of me, something alive, something crawling directly inside my skull. With my eyes free, I blinked. And then I blinked again. The training video seemed to snap out of existence, replaced by a white screen. The following footage is top secret. Unauthorized viewing of the following is punishable by 06-356-GM6. See protocol. If a subject resists... Please refer to protocol H912, neutralization. Please stand by. But the others were still talking, I realized. I could hear them reciting another coffee recipe in a symphony drone. Whatever the training video was, it wasn't playing for Anna. Only for us. Only for me when my eyes were completely open. It didn't take Anna long to notice. The dull fog that had been choking my brain for hours was starting to lift. All those thoughts that had been forced back were drifting back into the forefront of my mind. I managed to tear one wrist free, but Anna was in front of me before I could try anything else. I remember crying out. I remember begging her, but she didn't listen. 
Her smile was gone. I didn't see a woman in charge of a coffee chain. I saw someone else. Someone a lot higher up. When my eyes were held open once again, my panicked gaze found the screen, which once again flickered back to the training video. The presenter and Sarah were back in front of the camera, like they were waiting for me. The presenter was shaking her head with a frown. Uh-oh, she said. Looks like someone is lagging behind. Let's try this again, shall we? Yes, the others droned. Let's try this again. If you're wondering what happened after that, I have no idea. I remember going back to my apartment. I fell asleep and woke up three days later. My roommate thought I was dead. Worse still, I keep blacking out at random times of the day. I'll be at home on my laptop and then I'm sitting in my kitchen talking to my roommate with no memories of the conversation. When I asked her what was going on, she seemed confused. This morning I woke up standing in the back rooms of Starbrooks. Sam, Luna, and Ben were with me. Anna was talking to us, but I don't remember what she was saying. There were two men in black standing either side of her. I think they were armed, though I can't be sure. I don't know if this is even real. I don't know if my mind is playing tricks on me. I keep blacking out and waking up somewhere completely different. I've had this recurring nightmare that I'm strapped down. The room is dim, and there is no light. The only light is the one looming over me. It's so bright it hurts my eyes. Something sharp is pointed directly at my face. There are people in white dotted around me. They wear masks and stare at me with quizzical eyes that don't blink. Every nightmare I have, the needle gets closer. My roommate thinks I need to go and see a doctor. I told her the Starbrooks video did something to me, but she thinks I'm playing around. I just know I'm not the same. I don't sleep. I barely eat. I can't remember the last time I went to class. I don't work at Starbucks, and yet I'm always there. I'm always standing in front of Anna. But her words never make sense when I try to go over them in my head. I just know I have to do something. I have to do something important. I know something for sure. Whatever I'm doing... I don't think I'm making coffees. 